Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're out with top foxer Gary Green, looking for a tricky fox. Plus we look at Pulsar's latest piece of night vision equipment that's both very effective and easy on the pocket. Gary Green shoots a lot of foxes, but there's one vixen that has eluded him for a full year. We join him on a mission to track it down. Well, here we are again after a 6.30 start this morning. Um, <clears throat> three and a half hour session this morning and no fox. All the bait had gone. Um, but this is a year on now. And it's definitely the one I've seen roughly a year ago to the month, I think. Um, yeah, it's just been driving me crazy, really. But it's just, whenever it's here, I've never got a rifle. And when I've got a rifle, it's not here. So it's just one of them. It's, it's, I've got to get it. I've got the utmost, utmost uh, respect for them. But um, this one's very efficient. Too much, um, you know, wildlife here, as well as chickens, geese, etc., etc. Young deer will be born for long, that, that's still about, that will take its share of them, I'm sure, as well. But it'll be, be interesting evening, I think. I'm, well, I'm hoping after all this time it's a vixen, because <laughs> they're normally really clever. If it's a dog, then I don't know nothing anymore. <laughs> I'm trying all the tricks in the book with this one. We've tried everything, calling it, not calling it, feeding it. I don't know. We've got a high seat behind us here in the tree. We've got a bit of cover, there's a bit of leaf come out on the chestnut as well now, so it might keep a bit of shelves off us if we get it. I think we will. Um, nice, quiet location. Um, not far, really, as the crow flies for a fox from a nature reserve, cemetery. There's quite a lot of ground back there where it's more than happy to come quite a long way once it's found what it's after, after it's killed everything else what's here. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do, just keep it coming so we can deal with it. Um, because we can't really do anything again here until this is gone, I think. It's one of them. <laughs> so we've got um, a RPA 223 with these new uh, Gecko uh, 56 grain ballistic bullets. Really nice, um, very, very flat. Uh, they seem, as factory loads, very reliable. They hold a good group. We've got the scope on it at the moment. It's actually, um, it's actually a Savosky um, Z6i 2x5x15x56 uh, variable. Um, lovely, very good quality light gathering. I like it a lot. 30mm uh, tube and I've got quick release mounts on her. So if we need to, hopefully we don't, go on till three and or some ungodly hour, uh, we can slip over. I've got an NV550 with uh, quick release on as well. So we can swap over up there if we need to push on into the dark. But yeah, we've got the options. We've got the options. Yeah, you know, I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be all right tonight. Famous last words, eh? Up in the high seat, Gary settles in for what could be a very long wait. The fox might have been around for a year, but it's only recently started taking an interest in the local farmer's collection of ducks and geese, so getting to grips with it is a priority. Cock pheasant. Cock pheasant. It's so low in that ground, I thought we was away there. There is plenty of other fauna to be seen, but no fox. As the last rays of sunlight drain away, it's looking more and more like this will be the all-night foxing expedition Gary was dreading. But that's the life of a wildlife manager. The keeper's mantra is to wait until you're sure you won't see anything, and then wait another 20 minutes. And that's just what we'll do. 
With darkness falling, Gary considers readying the Pulsar N550 night vision unit. The RPA's weaver rail means he can easily switch it for his scope and he's confident it will hold zero. But the Schwarfsky's excellent light gathering capabilities means he can hold on just a little longer. Sadly, there's no luck yet with the Fox. There might be enough light for the Swarovski, but there's not enough light for our camera, and we switch to NV. Just as Gary's about to do the same, we spot the movement. It's clearly a fox. Gary can't be sure it's the one he's been after, but an opportunity like this isn't one to turn down. The fox moves boldly across the field towards the bait point. It might be dark, but Gary tries to draw a bead through the day scope, and he's in luck. The optic provides a much clearer view than the naked eye, and with the illuminated aiming mark, Gary feels confident taking the shot. The shot looks good, but the fox jumps off and runs for it. This wasn't part of the plan. As you can see, we've had the shot, and I heard it pop, so I know I've made contact. And I see it take up in the end. The tower spun, which is a very good indication that you've made good contact. So we're going to go and hopefully pick it up. But it's definitely hit. And I've had them run occasionally 60 yards, just pure adrenaline, but stone dead. So I'm just hoping that's the case. So uh, I've made safe with a gun. And now we're going to carefully go down in the dark and see if we can uh, retrieve. Um, quite incredible after all this time. We've got now still not got no fox, but let's hope we can pick it up. Gary's concerned but confident that the fox won't have gone far and heads down to look for it. He's sure it was hit hard in the vitals and now deceased. And see if I can see through from the back as it's a bit clearer around. He heads into some thick foliage and we're sure he's got it. But he actually comes back empty handed. No luck in here, Joe. It went up in the air and its tail was spinning. Definitely heard a pop, a strike. And I thought we'd find it back there, no problem. But uh, that's a bit thick there. So it's a morning job now with a little tackle. That'll be Poppy, the little tackle. Tracking dog. She's very good. I, just, I, I can't see any earth or not even the rabbit holes in that bit there, so it's either going to be in there or out on the field behind, I'm sure. There won't be much farther, not, not with that crash on it. Very, very frustrating. I think that's all, all adds to the character of this fox. Yeah, I'm uh, very disappointed, but there you are, that's foxing. Without knowing for sure that the fox went down, or even that it was a vixen we've been after, we have to head home and plan to come back in the morning. And that's where things get better. Gary found his fox the next day, and it was a vixen after all. The bullet had done its job, but the fox had ran into thick cover to fall out of sight. The farmer will be pleased, at least until the next fox moves in to take her place. Gary finally finding his fox there, and now the shooting show news. This is the shooting show news. Shooting and conservation groups have united behind a new campaign to urge compliance with the law and safeguard the use of lead shot. Use Lead Legally aims to remind shooters of the law relating to lead and how to stay within it, in an attempt to reduce incidents that might encourage further restrictions on lead. Basque Chief Executive Richard Ali said everyone who shoots has a responsibility to obey the law, while the Countryside Alliance's Barney White Spunner said the improper use of lead should not be tolerated. Mark Winsor is the 2013 Clay Shooting Classic champion after shooting 144x150 at EJ Churchill at the weekend. George Digweed led the field early with 140, but Winsor's score came in on the morning of the second day and went unbeaten for all of Saturday. Chris Childerhouse secured runner-up late on with 142, while Paul Simpson was third. Along with the trophy, Mark also took home a Zolli Z Extra Sport and 2,000 Ely Hawk cartridges. Great, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with the result. Yeah, it, was a, it was a good course, um, really happy with our shot. Um, hard work, had to really dig in at times, but 
you know, we're all really happy with it. Full report in the next issue of Clay Shooting Magazine. Nearly 2,000 people attended the Philip Scott Memorial Game Fair and Shoot at Ask Hall, raising over £12,000. Organiser Mike Scott said it was an amazing result. The fund was set up in memory of headkeeper Mike Scott's son, Philip, who was killed in Afghanistan in 2009. The total will be divided between the ABF, the Soldiers' Charity, the Rifles Welfare Trust and Care for Casualties. A final challenge to the Badger Cull has failed meaning pilots are cleared to begin in two areas in West Somerset and West Gloucestershire. Labour brought a motion against the cull to the House of Commons, but it was defeated by 299 votes to 250. Environment Secretary Owen Paterson said the cull would safeguard the UK cattle market, which was valued at £1.7 billion in 2011. It's the last week you can respond to an EU consultation on firearms law across Europe. The survey, open to everyone, asked respondents a range of questions on the extent to which the EU should take action against the use of firearms. Basque has urged shooters to respond, saying no action is required. The closing date to respond is next Monday. Follow the link on screen now. That was the Shooting Show news. Night vision is becoming more and more affordable, and when digital night vision hit the market, it pretty much opened it up to everybody. Today we're going to take a look at one of the newest units to hit the market and that's the Pulsar DFA75. Now it follows on uh, from the 550 and the 750 which came before except unlike them this is a front mounted unit. Now I'm going to show you how to set it up and uh, maybe later on we can take it out and see if we can shoot a few rabbits with it. So the first thing that you need to tackle is the scope adapter. I've got a Swarovski scope here on this 17 HMR and it's got a 50mm objective lens, so I have the 50mm adapter which allows you to mount the night vision on the front of your scope. Now each adapter comes with multiple spacers and I've already had this on so I know that this spacer fits this scope very snugly. Now you will note here that this is not completely round, it's actually got a flat edge on it. This flat edge goes to the bottom and gives you a bit more space between your scope and the barrel. Another thing which is very important to note and uh, this was passed on to me by somebody who's had the unit a bit longer than I have, is that once this is on and it's snug and you've tightened it up, you don't want to take this off. You will notice that there's a, a bayonet fitting on the front and this is how uh, the night vision attaches to the adapter and we'll see that a little bit later. But once you have this on, you want to leave it on your scope and only take the bayonet fitting out and only that way will you be able to hold zero. If you take this off with the clamp, you'll never be able to get it to return to zero every time. Okay, so before tightening it up, th there's two tightening screws. First of all, we've got the Allen screw here. Now you want to pretty much do that up as tight as you can go while still being able to put the lever over. But first of all, we need to just square it up with the night vision unit. So we get to the point where we have to attach it. And it's as simple as basically putting in the light bulb if we just put this in like this and then just twist it round and you will see on the side here there's a little catch which goes in and to remove it you have to depress this so that's that all secure now we get to the point where we actually have to look through it because we need to try and square up the frame inside and clamp it down before we do anything else. Okay, so having installed the battery unit, the next thing to do is to make sure that your night vision is square with your scope. Now, unfortunately, I can't really show you this on film, but if you have a look through your scope, having turned it on by pressing this button for a couple of seconds, you just want to make sure that the square screen, and you'll need to crank the scope down to low power to see this, you want to make sure that it's uh, pretty square and central with the crosshairs. And once you have it central, all you have to do is tighten up your clamp. Now we're not really going to need the illuminator for the daytime zeroing, but I'm going to fit it anyway just to show you how it works. You'll see on the side of your unit here, um, there's this what looks like a bit of a button, but in actual fact, if you give it a twist, it'll unscrew and it will become evident where your illuminator screws in. The adjustment for the illuminator um, so that you can 
uh, vary the brightness is on the side here. So you can go off, which we'll probably have it for this zeroing um, to the most intense at the top. There are two ways to calibrate your DFA night vision unit in order to get it zeroed. And I'm going to go through both of those. But first, it's important to understand exactly how this works. Now, if you have a look at the front, you will notice that the objective lens of the DFA sits above the objective lens of your scope. So if you were to draw two straight line of sights from the scope and the DFA, they would sit parallel with one another. And in actual fact, the distance between that is four and a half centimeters. So you would always be four and a half centimeters out if these were set up as straight line of sight. The first way to calibrate this is to actually zero the unit at a specific range. So if we zero it, and I'm going to show you how to go about that at say 50 meters, what you are doing essentially is angling the line of sight of your DFA unit to transect the straight line of sight from your scope. So it comes down at an angle like this, passes 50 meters and beyond. And what that essentially means for shooting is any distance that's less than 50 meters when you take a shot, your bullet will drop low. And any distance beyond 50 meters, when you take a shot, your bullet will actually go high. It's a little bit counterintuitive to what we're used to with bullet drop. The second way to set up your DFA unit is to maintain the parallel lines of sight between the scope and the night vision objective lens. Now, in order to do that, what you need to do is zero it so that your bullet drops four and a half centimeters below where you're actually aiming. And that will make sure that the lines of sight are completely parallel. Now, the easy way to explain that is that when you go through the zeroing process that we're about to go through, instead of zeroing it in at a specific range to hit the bullseye, if you've got the crosshair in the center of the target, you want the bullet to be dropping four and a half centimeters below. And if you have that out to any range, ignoring bullet drop, it will always be four and a half centimeters low, which will mean, of course, if you want to hit what you're aiming at, you need to hold over by four and a half centimeters. Although the video output unit that we're using lets you see what I'm looking at, unfortunately, it doesn't let you see the internal menu settings that I'm scrolling through. And it also doesn't let you see the internal crosshairs which are used to calibrate the DFA. So we're gonna to have to use diagrams on top of me explaining exactly what you have to do. So let's go through the motions. Now, if I look through the scope, I'm looking at my screen, the first thing to do is access the menu settings. Now you do that just by holding this in for a second. Once you've done that, in the bottom left corner, you will end up with a little box with symbols inside. Twisting this scrolls through them until you get to an X, which is your crosshairs. Press it in once, and on your screen, you'll end up with a box and a little cross, as well as being able to still see your crosshairs. This part of the, um, the calibration and zeroing, all you have to do is move the little cross so that it's slap bang in the center of your crosshairs. Now, initially, when you enter this, turning the wheel left and right will move the cross left and right. So I've got it in a central position. If I just press it in again once, it'll move it from left and right to up and down. So turning it clockwise and anti-clockwise moves it up and down. Now I've adjusted that cross so that it's exactly in the center of my crosshairs. Now once you've done that, you need to hold this button in for two seconds. Hold it in for two seconds. What you then get is another screen with another cross and some X and Y coordinates. Now at the moment, we don't actually need these. So we need to come out of this menu setting and fire a shot and see where it goes. To do that, hold the button in again for two seconds. So we need to enter the second stage now. So holding the button in for two seconds enters the second stage. Now what you need to do with the second stage is move the cross in the same way you moved it in the first stage to the position where your bullet struck the paper.
And then once you've done that, hold the button for two seconds to come out the menu. And you should see on the screen the crosshair and the screen jump. And that is uh, it recalibrating to zero. So what we'll do now is we'll fire another shot and see where it goes. I'm not expecting it to be absolutely spot on, but it should be somewhere near where I'm shooting now. You can go and have a look. Well, that can't be too bad. The first shot I fired went just down here. I then went into the, the second calibration menu setting. I moved the little cross on the screen down to where the bullet had struck, keeping the crosshair of my scope in the center. Reset it, fired the second shot, slap bang in the middle. It doesn't happen as easily as that every time, and I obviously need to go and shoot a group now to make sure that it's shooting consistently, but uh, uh, we're certainly not too far off the mark now. Okay, so that's me double checked 50 yards. Let's go in, take a shot at 25, move back, take a shot at 75, and see exactly where these bullets are going to go. So we can see here the result of setting up the DFA unit to a specific range. We had it zeroed at 50 yards, which was slap bang in the center of this circle. I came into 25 yards, took a shot, dropped the bullet two and a half centimeters low, exactly where I was expecting it. Moved back to 75 yards and it put the bullet two and a half centimeters high, again, exactly where we expected it to go. This bit of drift is just because it's a bit windy today, so the light 17 gray bullet is moving a bit. So that's absolutely fine. Now, because it's a diagonal line of sight from your DFA unit down to a straight line of sight of your scope, if you were to zero it at 100 yards, you would end up with exactly the same differences in bullet placement at 50 and 150 yards with the 100 yard zero. So you need to set it up depending on the caliber that you're using and what ranges you expect to be shooting. But I'm pretty happy with that and I'm sure we'll be able to roll over a few bunnies with it now. Well that's it for this week, thanks for watching. We're out every Monday 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.